Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is explaining the democratic peace. So remember that in the last lecture, we saw that two democracies as a pair of democracies tend to fight each other less frequently than other pairs of countries. And it'd be really great if we could come up with some sort of theoretical mechanism for why that's the case. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's the big, qu uh, big question for this video is how does democracy cause peace? And I'm going to offer three different explanations for this observation of the democratic peace, and I'm going to offer some criticism for them as well. All right, so the three theories that we're going to be talking about today are the culture of contracts argument, transparency, and electoral incentives. Let's kick things off with the culture of contracts. So this is a behavioral explanation for the democratic peace. And if you live in a democracy, I want you to just think about how you conduct your everyday life. When you have a disagreement with somebody, generally you don't start punching that person or shooting that person or pulling out a knife or pulling out a nuclear weapon at that person. That's something that you don't do to other people in democracies. If you have an argument with someone in a democracy, then you either sit down and negotiate a problem or a resolution to the problem between the two of you and you agree to that solution. Or if you can't come up with some agreement like that, then you take it to a court and the court irons out some sort of resolution and you're contractually bound to that agreement. So basically, violence is not allowed in these sorts of situations. And what this culture of contracts theory is arguing is that this conditions people who live in democracies to seek out these sorts of peaceful resolutions to problems. So if I in the United States have a problem with Mexico, because I'm so conditioned to resolving these things peacefully, my inclination is not to go send an army out to Mexico. It's to call up the Mexican president and request that we sit down and discuss the issues and hammer out an agreement, because that's what we're conditioned to doing. So that's the behavioral explanation in the culture of contracts. Moving on, the transparency argument looks like this. So recall back to the unit on rationalist explanations for war. Remember that uncertainty about resolve causes conflict. So if I suspect that you don't really care very much about the issues at hand, then my optimal offer is going to demand a lot out of you. And if it turns out that you actually do care a lot about the issues, then you're going to reject my offer and fight a war. So that's, again, in a nutshell, uncertainty about resolve causing conflict. What's great about this sort of class is that these sorts of explanations will come back up again and again and again and again. So this was really important from before. If you don't remember that argument, you should go back to that video. In fact, you should go back to that entire series because these things pop up again and again. This class builds off of itself. So that's important. And that's something you need to understand in order to be able to buy the rest of this argument. But suppose you, you believe that this is true, that uncertainty about resolve causes conflict, then it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for a state to be uncertain about a democracy's level of resolve. Why is that? Well, if you are wondering what people in a democracy are thinking, you just look at public polling data. It's readily available to everyone, including the evil dictators of the world. So if I am your antagonist, if I, you're living in a democracy and I am your antagonist, I don't have this problem with uncertainty because I can actually just go ahead and look at the latest polling data that's available online and I'll know how resolved you are on the issues based off of that. And so I'm going to make an offer that's going to be tailored accordingly and that kind of offer is not going to resolve or not going to result in conflict because I know the offer that I'm supposed to make to get you to accept. And so less private information in this case leads to less war, and that's how transparency is resolving this conflict between two democracies. We see what's going on in the democracies, and so we know that we're not going to be fighting one another because we can tailor our offers accordingly. Now the last topic here is the electoral incentives argument for the democratic peace. This is actually called the selectorate theory. So every state has a selectorate. That just means the group of individuals necessary to remain in power. So this concept of a selectorate, I think, is fairly common and understood understood when we're talking about democracies. In a democracy where a majority rules, then the selectorate in a democracy is simply half of all the voters plus one. We would actually call that the electorate in a democracy. But the reason that we call this a selectorate is because we're trying to generalize this idea of an electorate to government types outside of democracy. So for example, in autocracy, we would generally not think that there is a group of people that you need to actually satisfy in order to stay in power, because we think of autocrats as just dictators, and they're in charge of everything and everything that they say goes. But that's actually not really true. If you 
think a little bit harder about it. As a, a tyrant, even you need to have your military commanders and a handful of other politicians to be satisfied with you. Otherwise, you risk being th- overthrown in a coup. So even in an autocracy, you need to actually have some support of some other people. That's what the selectorate is in the autocracy. And it's noteworthy here that the selectorate in an autocracy is going to be much smaller than it is going to be in a democracy. Because in an autocracy, you just need to buy off the political elites. In a democracy, you need to buy off the people. And there's a lot more people than there are political elites. Well, how does that work when we're talking about war? War is costly, but just because it's costly for the country as a whole doesn't mean it's costly for everyone. Some individuals will benefit from war. And it's easy to buy off a small number of people than it is to buy off a large number of people. So think back to the Persian Gulf War. When Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait to go steal Kuwaiti oil, think about the costs and the benefits. Who's paying the costs and who's paying or who's getting the benefits? The costs, well, that's being pretty much thrown onto the soldiers, and Saddam Hussein doesn't really give a damn about the soldiers. Saddam Hussein can say, we're going to go fight a war, and you guys are going to be the one paying the cost. Ha ha, I laugh at you. And if we win the war, if we're successful in taking over Kuwait, then we steal the Kuwaiti oil, and that's not going to be going to the soldiers. It's not going to be going to the people of Iraq. It's going to be going to Saddam Hussein and his cronies. So when you have a small number of people that you need to buy off, you can shove the costs of war onto somebody else and only reap the benefits for yourself. And so war just looks more attractive to you or more attractive for you as the leader. Now, in contrast, when we're looking at a large number of people in a democracy, the people are the ones who are going to be sharing the burden. So the burden of war passes through a lot more people in, well, in any war. But when you're looking at a democracy, you need to buy off or have the people in the democracy be happy in order for you to stay in power. And if you're going to be throwing a war at your people and they're going to be paying a lot of the costs, then that's not going to be good for you as the leader. So democratic leaders have less incentive to fight in this case. And so that's why this theory is arguing that we would expect to see a democratic peace because democratic leaders simply have incentive to follow the will of their people. And that means not get engaged in these wars that only have private benefits like we saw with Saddam Hussein in the Persian Gulf War. All right. So what do these theories imply? They all have a similar pattern here. They imply that two democracies together should have very little war, whether it's because of this culture of contracts argument or because democracies are transparent or because they have electoral concerns. And so they're trying to avoid having large costs be thrown at the people. So either way, in either case or in all three of these cases, you see democracy plus democracy implying very little war. In contrast, we would expect two non-democracies to engage in war. That's because they don't have these cultures of contract or culture of contracts. They aren't as transparent, and they only have to carry cater to their small political elites. The selectorate in these de- non-democracies is going to be smaller, and so they have more incentives to fight. And so we should see some war in that case. The interesting thing, though, is what these theories apply in the, the middle ground. So when you have a democracy and a non-democracy, they would imply that you would see a little bit more war. You would see the most war down here, you would see the least war up here, but you would see somewhere in between when we look at a democracy and a non-democracy. And the reason for that is that nothing in these theories say that you need to have two democracies together in order to get the result. In the culture of contracts argument, you just need to have one democracy who's conditioned to want to bargain over things, to decentivize conflict for that individual Uh, state. And while that's not going to necessarily apply to the other state, it's still going to make this guy over here less willing to fight. Likewise, when we look at the transparency argument, when one side is more transparent, so just the democracy here, we would expect to see him not get involved in conflicts as much, regardless as whether he's looking at another democracy up here or a non-democracy down here. And the same goes for that selectorate theory, when there's one democracy here, he's going to be less likely to want to fight a war, and so we should be seeing less war in this case as well. But that's not what we actually see in the statistical result. We see two democracies fighting very little war. We see two non-democracies fighting a lot of war. But in this case, we see that it's the same amount of war, that it doesn't matter whether we have a democracy and a non-democracy. As long as there's one non-democracy in the pair of countries, they fight at the same rate as if there would be two non-democracies or in the democracy and non-democracy case. It's only when you have two democracies together that you actually see this democratic peace result. And so this is a bit 
puzzling. All of the theories that we have don't actually get what we see empirically when we look at the statistics of war. We see that it's only two democracies together that is actually getting us not very much conflict. So what would be excellent is if we could sort of think about this theory in a different way or think about the explanation for the democratic peace theory to understand why we would expect this result to hold. And actually, in order to do that, we're going to be looking outside of the democratic peace. We're going to think about, well, you know, democracy is just one thing that could be going on here. Maybe democracy is actually hiding or obscuring the true reason that conflict is reduced between two countries. And so this is going to get into a bit of a problem with correlation versus causation, and that's what we're going to be discussing in the next video. And then we'll transfer from there into an alternative explanation for the democratic piece, which is called the capital capitalist piece. So I hope you enjoyed this video. That wraps things up for today. And next time we will be looking at correlation versus causation, which is just something that's really important to social sciences in general. So I hope you join me then. And until then, take care. Bye now.